<laughs> Dude, never did it. Welcome back to Never Did It. I'm Jake Ziegler. I'm here with Brad Garoon. On Never Did It, we look back at the last 100 years of movie history in an effort to fill in some of our movie blind spots. Today, we're covering the year 2007. Brad, why don't you tell me what movie you chose for me for this year? I gave you the micro-budgeted movie of The Man from Earth, or Man from Earth. I can't remember if it starts with The. I think it's The the Man from Earth, yeah. The Man from Earth. I, I watched this during my year of watching a movie every day for a reason. Those reasons are usually it's someone's birthday, someone died... Uh, national whatever day, like on National Ice Tea Day, I watched New Jack City. I've actually never seen that, but I know that's supposed to be good. I watched that on National Ice Tea Day. I don't remember the occasion that I watched this, but this is like a classic Tubi movie. It was made, I think, for just for nothing at all. And it is people sitting in a room talking, and then suddenly it's a sci-fi movie because of what they're talking about. And I just love that the movie is a sci-fi movie just because of what people are saying, not because of anything that happened. And that sci-fi conceit is that one of the people, uh, it's a going away party for him. He's a college professor and he's got all his college professor buddies with him. They are all kind of like slightly different. They're all intellectuals, but they're all slightly different. Some are religious, some are not, some are skeptics, some are not. And he tells them that he has to leave because he's been there too long and people are going to start to notice that he doesn't age. And not only does he not age, but he has existed since the dawn of man. And he has had to, every few years, change his life completely so that people don't realize that he is living forever. And why does he do that? Because in the past, when he stayed too long, they have thought he was a witch and tried to kill him. (laughs) Oh, man. I was like, what is this movie? What a cool conceit. And I wanted you to see it. And I saw your Letterboxd review, so I know you didn't like it as much as I did. But it seems like you did find it interesting. Tell me what you thought. That is exactly right. I did find it interesting. I, I really do like the conceit of the movie. And and like you, I love your list, the uh, the small sci-fi list. Mm-hmm. I just think that's such a cool idea because, yeah, there's not there are no effects in the movie. You know, it's not like they're they're not going anywhere or like doing anything. You know, yeah, they're just basically they're all just sitting in a room chatting with each other. I thought it was a really cool idea and a really cool setup. By the end of the movie, this it kind of fell apart for me in the third act a lot. But even like like the actors, they're not very good. And, yeah, the movie it looks every bit of the low budget that it is. But I found that kind of charming. And that whole whole bit of it. So I really liked it for about two thirds. And then, yeah, the last third was was not not so good. When, it's, when it turns into like, again, spoiler alert for 15, 16 year old movie at this point, when they start getting into like, I thought it's interesting enough to have a guy who's lived through that much history, um, you know, and have him talk about like, okay, what, and they ask him questions about history. And he's like, okay, I'm not omniscient. I'm still just one guy who's only lived one life, you know, like, okay, like, that's really cool. And like, you know, what were his experiences? But then when it's like, you can have like one of these things where it's like, okay, I have an actual Van Gogh painting from Van Gogh, like, Okay, that's kind of cool. You can you get one, but you don't get to hang out with Van Gogh, sail with Columbus, and be Jesus like all at one time. Like that's that's too much. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna get into how being Jesus kind of <laughs> while I think it's hilarious, it does, and this is not a comedy, it does kind of ruin everything. And that's why for me it's a four-star movie, not a five-star movie. <laughs> it does kind of ruin everything, especially, and we'll talk about this too, the sequel. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, they're not great actors. David Lee Smith, Tony Todd, especially. These are, uh, well, okay. So Tony Todd, people probably know from, if they know him at all, from Candyman. And then if they know John Billingsley at all, I believe he was on Star Trek Enterprise. Oh, okay. Uh, and that was, those were the only two. I recognized Tony Todd and I recognized John Billingsley. I did not know David Lee Smith. He's mostly known from Man from Earth and Man from Earth Holocene. Apparently, he was in Fight Club, but I don't recall that. Oh, yeah. We just watched that recently, too. Yeah. So clearly not a big role. I think he's solid. But what I'm getting at, especially with John Billingsley being from uh, Star Trek Enterprise, these are at best like TV actors. They're not these are not movie stars. Right. This is a teeny, teeny, tiny movie. The budget for this movie, two hundred thousand dollars. Right. That that tracks. And what I loved most about it, the idea I, I liked what you liked, the fact that he lived one life. And they had an explanation for why Jesus would have had the ideas he had when no one else around him would have had those ideas, Mm -hmm. which is that he was living in the East and learning. But then it's again, it's like too much. He was learning from, I think it was Confucius or Buddha? Buddha. From Buddha. The the Buddha. Right. So he's learning from Siddhartha and then brought that to the Middle East. And that's how Christianity started. So it's inherently a very blasphemous movie because Jesus is now immortal. 
and uh, white, and very, very God's white, son. very white. Well, that's fine. I mean, Christians love that, but yeah. uh, <laughs> but he is explicitly saying here that he's not God's son, or at least as far as he knows, he's not God's son, and he's living forever. Right. In the second movie, you get into more of like why he might. Oh God, what, what, I have to save it. <laughs> but I thought it was cool, like the practicality of it, and you're throwing practicality out the window because the sky has lived forever, but. The practicality of someone bringing over Buddhist ideas and that infusing that into Judaism and that becoming Christianity. That's an interesting thought. He doesn't have to be Jesus. That's the issue. Like, <laughs> Why couldn't he have just like been around? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, there was another, different ways they could have done it. Right. But everything up to that point is interesting, mostly because not of what he's saying, that he has to convince these people that it's true mm -hmm. um, or he doesn't have to. He's leaving one way or another, but he has decided he wants to convince these people that it's true. He's never done that. He's, he's trying something new. There is an episode of the show Sandman based on the Neil Gaiman graphic novel. Mm -hmm. One episode that is very similar to this. A guy gets the Sandman to make him live forever. And then he and the Sandman, well, he and Dream, that's the character's name. They meet every, I think, hundred years or so at the same place. And that that's like another piece like this that's probably done a little bit better than this. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in the story but don't want the religious overtones of it, just watch the Sandman episode where the guy lives forever. But this just made my brain really perk up and think like, man, what other cool stories could come out of this? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the story that did come out of this was bad. <laughs> and that's the story in the movie Man from Earth Holocene, the sequel, which came out, what, like two years later? 10. 10 years later? Yeah, it's 2017. Oh, I guess that makes sense because David Lee Smith has to look older. That's like yeah. the whole thing. So they do this sequel. David Lee Smith, now a little bit gray, thinks that the either the environment or his diet are causing him to finally age. Something has shifted. <laughs> and there's these three students who kidnap him and hold him hostage to see if it's true that he was Jesus Christ. And one of the kids is religious and is just having a meltdown over it. <laughs> And it it's sucks so that weird. they it's so weird and it just sucks that they took the least interesting part of the first movie and made that everything about the mm -hmm. second movie. From my understanding, this was gonna be a whole series of movies. And after the second movie was just terrible, it was like, well, why even bother? Yeah. Yeah. And the, well, the, there's the one kid, yeah, who's super into Jesus. Uh, and he's, you know, he's like really upset by this. But then there's also like the one girl who just like really badly wants to sleep with him. And, yeah. and that's just like super awkward. Just every time she does, I don't know, anything. Yeah. The second one is just, it's just a really, just really a bad movie in, in every possible aspect. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I mean, I, yeah. I, I have no defense. I will defend the first movie. I have <laughs> no defense or desire to defend the second movie. I think it's terrible. Are you, have you seen a lot of these like really tiny budget movies? There's like Neil Breen movies. Have you ever seen a Neil Breen movie? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, so Neil Breen is this guy who self finances all his movies, and he's made tons, and they're all super strange, but they have a big cult following. Mm -hmm. He's a very weird guy. I don't know. It's just like basically what happens is a rich guy decides he wants to make a movie, or like um, there's a sequel to Showgirls. That's like, is there? Yeah, that like looks kind of like this. It's like no budge goes off in a totally different direction. People just like getting the rights to something and making something on no budget whatsoever. Right. For me, this is like, you know, I, you mentioned my small sci-fi list. This is a great collision between small sci-fi, which is stuff like this and Freaks, Anyara. I know I've talked about Anyara on a previous episode. Or like The Infinite Man is a great version of this. It's an Australian one where a guy is stuck in a time loop and it all takes place in this like hotel in the middle of nowhere in Australia or coherence which is a cool one about people at a dinner party and it's not there's not a single special effect everything's done with like glow sticks that's like the biggest special effect is that they, they hold glow sticks and like there's a blackout and maybe there's alternate versions of everyone but it's all done with just like the actors those are the big ones so i don't even have like man from earth holocene on my small sci-fi list because i don't think it deserves it it's bad so anyway all in i like it a lot i think it's worth checking out it's really really short um, yeah it's like 80 minutes maybe yeah, and maybe it'll inspire some people to like make movies of their own because it shows you that you can do high concept movies that that are just people talking to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like I, said, I really, I was, it was, I was bummed, you know, like that the the, the last third went the direction that it did because yeah, I was really into it and was like really excited watching it the first because yeah, like this is such a cool concept and it, was, it just kind of bummed me out. But yeah, I, I still recommend it. Uh, worth worth checking out. You know, it's if it's like yeah, you can watch it free on like Tubi, Vudu free. I um, mean, it's, it's a bunch of places. So yeah, I would definitely recommend it everywhere. And it also is inspiring because there's probably a lot of other movies like this that we just don't know about and maybe we'll stumble on them. Yeah. All right. You gave me the savages. Yes. 
because you wanted me to be sad, I guess. I mean, what, what happened here? <laughs> well, you know, like a lot of our, our years in the recent, I mean, 2007, we'd, you know, you'd seen a lot of the movies that I'd seen. And uh, this was a movie that, that I loved. I, I'm pretty sure I saw it with my sister, actually, when it came out. But I don't think I'd seen it since then. I love Laura Linney. I love Philip Seymour Hoffman. He's probably my all-time favorite actor. Between him and Paul Giamatti are probably my two favorites. And it's just even seeing Philip Seymour Hoffman right now, like I still, I know he died a long time ago and I normally don't get like this worked up about something, but like it's hard to watch him sometimes too because it just makes me sad, you know, like we don't have him anymore. So I don't know how many of his movies I've even watched recently. So, um, but I love him, love him as an actor. I knew I loved this performance. And like I said, I love Laura Linney. And I just think it's a really interesting movie about, you know, like these really interesting and unfortunately sad characters who are thrown into a situation that they are not equipped neither of them are equipped to handle uh emotionally <laughs> certainly not emotionally so yeah i guess i wanted to make you a little sad i know you assigned me this i think before it happened but um a couple of years ago my dad had a pretty nasty episode uh and wound up in the hospital and he's been dealing with some stuff since then he actually found out a couple of days after i watched the movie that he had a similar one not as bad didn't have to go to the hospital so watching stuff about dementia has been uh harder for me too and this is about you know laura linney and uh, philip seymour hoffman taking care of their dad with dementia near the end of his life it's it's a it's a comedy like a, a dark 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 comedy um so there are some laughs to be had one being just like what is going on with laura linney's wig this entire movie <laughs> i didn't understand why Not her normal had, hair yeah yeah very weird um i wonder if she was maybe going through something with her hair at the time and they just slapped mm -hmm. a wig on her for it um but i couldn't i couldn't find anything i just mm -hmm. very obviously not her hair yeah so i liked it we're, we're doing this episode earlier than we had planned to <laughs> Because I was sad last weekend that I couldn't see Dune the weekend it came out. Um, I, I got tickets for 70 millimeter IMAX the following week. And Tamara Jenkins' movie Private Lives was on Netflix. And I remember thinking that looked good. Uh, so we watched it. And I, and I looked it up. And I found out that Tamara Jenkins had only directed three movies. And I asked my wife if we could watch all three that day. And she was down because it was a rainy day. And we watched all three, and this was one of them. And I was like, Jake, I'm watching Savage. He goes, oh, I gave that to you. I'm like, all right, I guess we're doing that episode. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I guess real quick, I'm going to do my Tamara Jenkins rankings here mm. uh, just because it'll inform how I felt about the movie. So number one, Private Lives, incredible movie. I can't believe you haven't seen it. It's a Paul Giamatti. You just said Paul Giamatti's your favorite actor, aside from Philip Seymour Hoffman. I, I don't know what I'm doing. And this is an amazing Paul Giamatti performance. Like, very much on par with what he's done, what he did in Holdovers, and yet he got no love for Private Lives and mm -hmm. mega lauded for Holdovers. And mega, Holdovers is great, played drives or not, it's great. But he's incredible in Private Lives, and so is Catherine Hahn, and so is everyone. Um, there's a John Carroll Lynch small role for John Carroll Lynch, yep. and he's he's delightful. He's so great in it. He plays Paul Giamatti's brother. Awesome pairing. Anyway, that's number one with a bullet. That's a four and a half star movie. I love Private Lives. Number two, Slums of Beverly Hills, which a lot of people have probably heard of. It's sort of the beginning of Natasha Leone's career. Jewish people love it because it's like a small Jewish movie from the 90s. And and it's got Alan Arkin. So, and Marissa Tomei. I mean, it's an, and David Krumholtz. It's oh, like- Oh, I've not seen this movie. Yeah, it's it's awesome. <laughs> um, that's That also is really good. It's, it, uh, oh, and uh, what's his name? Scorsese's guy, Kevin Corrigan. Just like- Oh, it. yeah. I've met that guy. Really? Yeah, he, uh, the year, remember, I've talked about Big Fan on the podcast before. Mm. Uh, he was at the Traverse City Film Festival the year that Big Fan played there. He and like Patton Oswalt was there too and everything. Like, so yeah, I'd say I met him. It was like in passing sort of thing. Right. Like it was at a film festival type of setting. But uh, yeah, he was there for Big Fan. Because he's actually might be the best part of the movie. And it's maybe his, it's probably the funniest thing he's done. Jessica Walter from Arrested Development and Carl Reiner are both in it too. Mm -hmm. That was her debut movie. That's Tamara Jenkins' debut movie. And she only made one movie every 10 years or so far. And then the third is this one. The Savages, which I also liked a lot. With this one, I did not really feel like I had a way in. I felt a little removed from it because of the dementia stuff. I didn't want to get too upset. So I sort of felt like I kept the movie at bay a little bit. But also, Laura Linney and Philip Seymour Hoffman's characters are so unlikable. And that does not make a movie bad. But it did make it hard for me to, to sympathize with either of them. In every case, I just thought, well, I don't care what happens to you. You stink. Until the cat showed up. And then I was very invested in what happened to the cat. Genghis, great name for um, a cat. And Molly, the dog? Marley. Marley. Oh, that's weird that her name was Marley. Yeah. She was a golden retriever. And I think it was before, yeah, it was before Marley and me came out. Maybe the book too. Well, spoiler alert, this Marley doesn't die. And that that's is right. absolutely a spoiler for the end of this movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this Marley lives. Mm -hmm. And the movie does have a happy ending, which is nice. Yeah, it's nice. It's, it's, it's kind of funny. I think it's maybe for me like 20 minutes too long. 
for what they're doing with it. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone in it's incredible. Uh, Linny is the only person who could play this role. And I say that because she's always playing this role. She's got I'm it like, down. I mean, it's, you can count on me. She plays it, you know, kind of a similar role in that. And, and Truman uh, show. And, and Truman show, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I love her. I have, she's great. Yeah. I haven't seen Ozarks. I, I was wondering where she's been. And it turns out she's been in the show, the Ozarks. That's what she's. Oh been. yeah. I've heard that show's great. Yeah. Me too. I assume she's playing the same character. In Probably. That. Yeah. Um, but if you need someone to be put upon, she's there for you. She's your gal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then Hoffman's great. Also playing a character he plays often. She's just like a really unhappy, grumpy, smart person. Oh, but if you want to talk about funny, the five minutes he spends in a neck brace hung from his front door <laughs> and just like having a regular conversation while in this neck brace is some of the funniest stuff you'll ever see. He is so well, he hurts himself. Just one thing he does. One, they're trying to play like little tennis or whatever with each other. Yep. He moves one thing. That's all it takes. <laughs> At this point, I don't think it's underrated how much of a physical comedian he was. Yeah. Even like Along Came Polly. He's so amazing in that one scene where he's just like a tornado ripping through that basketball court. <laughs> yeah. Or even like even the best part of a bad movie there. I actually think Along Came Polly is fine. As far as like, sh you know, schlocky Stiller Sandler movies goes, it's like pretty solid. But he does elevate it a lot with his just being there. His man. Yeah, his energy. It very much feels like a role that was written for Jack Black, and then they got him somehow. Right. Yeah, definitely. There's a Jack Blackian quality to it. Yeah. Ugh, I just watched Kung Fu Panda 4. It's not great. Oh, bummer. I'm still taking yeah. my kid to it. Yeah. Oh, it's not bad. Mm. You know, it's a perfectly reasonable way to spend 90 minutes, but it's not. And honestly, if there had been no Kung Fu Panda 1, 2, and 3, I might not even care that it's not great. But mm. boy, I just I love those characters, and they just not are not put to good use in it. Yeah, they're wonderful. You know, this was the last role for what's his name? Philip Bosco. Yeah. Um, and I thought he was really good in it, too. The way he uh, interacts, you know, interacts with his children who are, you know, they've been basically estranged uh, from them. So like, so they have no real relationship to speak of. And then all of a sudden they're kind of just thrust together, uh, you know, all of a sudden spending all this time together. And, you know, he's going through dementia. So he only recognizes them part of the time, even, you know, even knows who they are. And even if he recognizes them, you know, recognizes them, he doesn't know what they do. You know, he doesn't know anything about them. Like he, he tells us, he tells uh Philip Seymour Hoffman early on, he's like, yeah, you're a doctor, do something. And then Laura Linney has to explain that, like, no, he's a doctor of, uh, you know, philosophy or whatever he is, <laughs> whatever he is. Like, he's not a medical doctor. And right. like, he didn't even know that about his you know, son. They hadn't seen him in like 20 years or something. So I, I just, I really think it's an interesting character piece about these three characters who are kind of, you know, and even the brother and sister, Philip Seymour Hoffman and Laura Linney, they're like, they're not really estranged, but you can tell like that they don't, they're not particularly close. They get thrown together. And and I just think it's a really interesting dynamic that they have. And, and like I said, I'm in the bag for Philip Seymour Hoffman like I'm I'm gonna be attached to a character that he plays like you said you have you had a, had a hard way in I don't have that with him whereas like I'm in to begin with it really moved me um in a, in a lot of ways you know just to watch them trying to care for this person who as they even say like never really cared for us there are two different ways of doing it you know where Laura Linney has the guilt and where she wants to you know, like really take good care of him and like put him into a nice place and films oh, like they're all the same you know on the inside it's like we should we just have to put him somewhere taking better care of him than he ever did of us sort of thing they clash but they're still I don't, they still love each other, but they're, you know, they don't know each other. Still, they don't know each other. So they're trying to figure out how to work together on this. And I was, I was really taken with it. I definitely liked it more than you. Well, you're leaving out sort of an important part of their relationship, which is their rivals. They that do, too, yeah. they do very similar things and they're very jealous of each other and they make things up. He's more successful of a writer than she is. So she makes up stuff about her writing career. She's having what you could call a successful affair with an older guy played by Peter Friedman, who is very funny and like clueless. But she does have a slightly, even though it's crap, she has a slightly more fulfilling personal life than him. Whereas he has this relationship with a Polish woman who... Uh, played by Kara Seymour, who he loves, who he lies about how emotionally invested he is in her because she is going back to Poland and doesn't want to marry him. I think it's he doesn't want to marry her. Well, that's what he says. But then she later says he cries all the time. And uh, it turns out he's not telling the truth about what's going on. He, yeah, he does have that scene in the bathroom where he's we're in the hotel. We see him cry. There's also just like she makes him breakfast and he cries in front of everyone. Yeah. She says he cries at breakfast every morning. Yeah. She, she doesn't want to deal with it. So he takes her to Poland. Then you find out later he's going to Poland, which is nice. Yeah, that is nice. Yeah. And there's another not related to their relationship, but then Laura Linney has not an affair, but she has like a nice connection with this nurse named Jimmy at the old folks home played by a guy named, um, I don't know how to pronounce it. So I'm going to pronounce it wrong. Gebengba Akanagbe. 
He's very good. And she thinks it's more than it is because she is so starving for affection. But even when it's not what she thinks it is, they have like a nice moment together. Mm-hmm. She doesn't shun her or anything. You know, like even no. when she crosses the line, you know, he doesn't. Uh, he's a total he, sweetheart. He's he's like he's far and away the most likable person in this movie, except maybe because she's our favorite, a very small cameo by character actress Margot Martindale. I was so stoked to see her. I didn't remember her being in the movie. So yeah, my wife Megan watched it with me too, and she is a big BoJack Horseman fan. So yeah, every time we see Margot Martindale, it's a, it's a big event in our house. And it makes you realize how much BoJack and probably also her season of Justified elevated her stature because this is before all that. And she's mm-hmm. literally in this movie for 30 seconds. Yeah, it's like one scene and that's it. And she's not doing anything much. She's just interviewing them for the nicer nursing home. So it is pretty incredible to see how, you know, certain things can elevate someone. Jake, you have got to watch. You can skip the first couple seasons. You have got to watch her season of Justified. It's unreal. Mm-hmm. Obviously, The Man from Earth, I don't even know if it played in theaters at all. It probably played at like some small festivals and stuff, but yeah. certainly didn't qualify for any Oscars. How did The Savages? Savages did okay, actually. It was uh, nominated for two. Two of them. Laura Linney was up for Best Actress for this, and she lost to uh, Marianne Cotillard for La Vie en Rose, um, which is which is okay. Marianne Cotillard was, was really, really good in that. And then it was also up for Original Screenplay, which it lost to to Diablo Cody's Juno, which I felt at the time was extremely overrated. Um, I don't like her writing style at all. And I I feel like it's also aged poorly in addition to not being that good at the time. So I think Savages would have been a better choice there. There probably would have were other choices that were better than Juno, but at least it got a little bit of recognition. I like Juno a lot and I don't think it's aged as poorly as people think. Like I actually don't think it's an anti-abortion movie at all. I don't think so either. Yeah, which is another. Actually, I'm, we're going to talk about Juno when we do our Villeneuve rankings because there's some oh. crossover between Juno and Maelstrom. Oh, and thematically, I'm surprised to hear you say you don't like Diablo Cody's writing style. You didn't like Tully or Young Adult. I, I, no, that's right. That's right. I do like Tully. I just I really didn't like Juno. And what's the other one she did? Uh... Jennifer's Body. Yeah, Jennifer's Body is okay. So you're you're more you didn't like one. Really, movie. I just don't like Juno. Actually, now yeah. that we say it, now that we we sussed that out, yeah, I really just don't like Juno. I, I just thought say, it was like, really Diablo Cody's written some good movies. She has. Now, I forgot. She, honestly, I just forgot she did Tully because I really yeah. did like Tully. Yeah. What about Young Adult? Have you seen that? Oh, gosh. Did she write Young Adult, too? Yep. Yep. Sorry, Diablo Cody. I like you. <laughs> okay, I just don't go. like Juno. But yeah, Young Adult, I actually think is like really underrated. Yeah. OK, there we go. We're back on track. All right. Sorry, Diablo. All right. Cool. Well, thank you for. Are we going to do? Do we have top tens? For oh, my goodness. Of course we do. It's two out of 2007. Red Groon. Wait, Come on. I forgot man. about what we do. I forgot about yeah. what we do. Yeah. Let me bring up my list. I've got mine. Pull up. Do you want me to do? Are we just doing top 10 or 20? Well, let's do top 10 because 2007 is insane. It's like one of the greatest years in movie history. And if we did, if we did top 20, we could do top 30. I mean, like it would be nuts. So That's let's true. just we got to cut it off somewhere. All right. I'm not going to even name any honorable mentions because like I said, it could, it could go on forever. So I'm just going to cut straight to the chase and go with number 10 is uh, Julian Schnabel's The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Uh, great per- lead performance. Matthew Amalric. Number nine for me is the aforementioned the Savages. And number eight is Sean Penn's Into the Wild. My number seven is Tony Gilroy's Michael Clayton, featuring a great, great performance from the late Tom Wilkinson. Lost him too soon. Number six is is the uh, Irish romance drama Once. Number five is one of my favorite modern westerns, 310 to Yuma. I think it's a very underrated movie. Great performances by Russell Crowe and Christian Bale in that one. Number four is another Philip Seymour Hoffman movie. He's got two in the top 10, and he's actually got a third one if we go down to my top 20. Uh, But number four is Sidney Lumet's Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. Uh, Great Philip Seymour Hoffman performance. Also Ethan Hawke, Albert Finney, and Marissa Tomei. Just an incredible movie. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that was Sidney Lumet's final movie. I believe it was. Yes, that's correct. Uh, number three. And now, I mean, these top three are just just upper echelon uh, all all the way. My number three is uh, David Fincher's Zodiac, which we've spoken about uh, on the podcast at length. Number two, which you will hear uh, more from us in the very near future, is uh, Joel and Ethan Cohen's No Country for Old Men. And then number one is Paul Thomas Anderson's There Will Be Blood. Uh, so we actually have a, quite a bit of overlap. Not surprising. Mm. Number 10, I have Judd Apatow's Knocked Up. Really um, funny. Yeah, I think it's actually become kind of for because the comedy, the studio comedy has been diminished. It's hard for people don't really like go back and think that much about past comedies anymore. I think Knocked Up is a really good one. And it was the jumping off point for Seth Rogen, who now is like producing all of the comedies. Well, I think the star hating the movie has kind of uh, diminished it in some people's estimation, too. Okay, but but she stinks. So whatever. (laughs) Number nine is Richard Shankman's The Man from Earth. We've said quite a bit about it. 
Mm-hmm. Number eight is Tony Gilroy's Michael Clayton. So the overlap has already begun. There it is. Uh, number seven, There Will Be Blood, P.T. Anderson. Number six is Sean Penn's Into the Wild. Oh, nice. Number five is David Fincher's Zodiac. <laughs> number four, rounding around back around to Jonah Hill. My my top four is a little bit different than yours, although not completely. Uh, number four is Greg Matola's Super Bad. Mm-hmm. which I rewatched recently and my wife hated, which I thought would skew my opinion of it, but no, it just had me dig in further. I, I just <laughs> love Superman. Number three is Edgar Wright's Hot Fuzz, which is one of the funniest movies of that decade. I love Hot Fuzz, yeah. Yeah, it's my favorite of that trilogy. Probably mine too, top, yeah. Yeah, top to bottom, just unbelievably funny. Kate Blanchett, yeah, really makes that movie. <laughs> uh, and, and everything. Number two is the Coen Brothers' No Country for Old Men, a... Just, I, you know what? I'll save it because as you mentioned, we're going to be talking about it more in a future episode. And number one is a movie that Jake actually introduced me to and a movie whose director has become worse, just like much, much worse with each film, including <laughs> this year's Argyle. And that's Matthew Vaughn. This is his film Stardust, which is, we mentioned Neil Gaiman earlier in this episode because of his writing of Sandman, which is very similar to Man from Earth. He wrote uh, Stardust, the book that this movie is based on. It stars Claire Danes and pre Daredevil Charlie Cox. Oh, right. Yeah. I- yep. Uh, it's got Sienna Miller being very cute. And then it has unbelievably great performance in villainous roles from Mark Strong and Michelle Pfeiffer. And it has what I consider to be a career best performance by Robert De Niro. He's so amazing. And it's so far off what he normally does. I love it. It's incredible. Stardust is the perfect I'm not feeling well movie. It will make you feel well. Just wonderful stuff. And I'm so happy Jake introduced me to it. You're welcome. I love it too. So that's it for 2007. We'll be back soon with, I don't know, we got a lot of stuff in the hopper. I don't want to spoil anything. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to know what is coming out next week, go to our Letterbox profile. You can find me at Brad Garoon on Letterbox. I think Jake, you're Jake Ziegler on Letterbox. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, Jake underscore Ziegler. And both of us have pinned to our profiles, our Never Did It podcast list. You could also just search for the Never Did It podcast list. And the two movies that will be discussed on next week's episode are always at the top of that list. We have a Facebook page now as well. You can check that out at uh, facebook.com slash Never Did It podcast. I'll be posting on that with uh, new episodes and uh, just fun updates from time to time about what we're watching and what's coming up. So check that out. And thank you for joining us for Never Did It.